Hi, and welcome to the next episode of my introduction to astronomy. I'm sorry that it has taken so long for me to making this uh, this this ne next episode. What can I say? I have been busy otherwise with life, as you know it. But my intent is now that I want to give you sort of a video every uh, every week or so. That's my intent. And as I have told you before, these, the purpose of these videos is to give you a basic introduction to astronomy. And the level will be somewhere around um, high school level, something like that. So uh, a little bit above, a little bit below. The level of these videos, the, the technical level, the, the difficulty, whatever you want to call it, it's actually up to you, what you want. So uh, you can tell me down in the comments below what you would like. You can also ask me questions if you want to do that. If there's something else you want to, uh, you, you're unsure of something you, you want to have uh, to get explained any further. And you, if you have suggestions for new videos, then you can also give me them there. I would also like to say right away that for you flat earthers that are following me, if there are any flat earthers that are following me, you are also uh, welcome to ask me questions in the comments down here. But please do remember that this series, series here is about astronomy in general. So I probably won't be answering questions. I won't be answering questions about Flat Earth. I have other videos for that. You can ask me there. But uh, let's get going with the videos, with the, the first lecture. So the first lecture is going to be sort of the basics, the, what you can go out and do on, on, on a clear night and what you can see, how we orient ourselves on the sky and those sort of things. So as you can see here, the solar system and the night sky by Michael Hansen, that's me. It says Roskilde Gymnasium. Well, that's not really true, but I haven't changed the name yet. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, but the date is probably correct. The first subject that we're going to delve into is going to be finding your way on the night sky. Now, if you notice me looking a little bit down, uh, that's because I have my laptop standing right there. I have my microphone standing right there and the camera is right there. Now I am running and recording a slideshow. That's the slideshow that you can see there on my laptop. So that's the reason why you're going to see me look down just a, uh, once in a while. Let's get going. Like I've said in the introduction, it would be good for you if you install some of these programs. So you can install a program called Stellarium. It's a relatively easy program to use. I'm going to give you some introduction video, a separate video on what you can do in Stellarium and all those things. Stellarium is a, what you call a computer observ observatory. It's a program that you can go in and you can look at the night sky and you can see different things and, and you can basically get a view of the night sky as you would see it uh, where you live. Um, and you can change it from day to night and all those things. So you can sort of use it for planning and you can use it to get um, coordinates on the sky. All sorts of information is in there, depending on how you set it up. Like I said, I'm going to make a separate, the, the second part of this introduction will be separately about Stellarium. It's probably not going to be that long. Also, I'm not totally sure about this, but so I want to apologize if you can see a lot of interruptions. It's because a lot of things is happening on my laptop right now. Eh, what can I say? It's been a while since I've last opened it and now it wants to show me all kinds of different things that I should install or take care of or all nothing important, but you know, the usual programs that pop up once in a while. Windows 10 is really fond of that. So yeah, what can I say? As an alternative to Stellarium, you can use a program called, uh, I think I'm trying to pronounce it uh, correctly in, in French, but if there are any French watching this and you, you, you are, you're welcome to say that it's wrong, but I think it's Carte de Ciel. Carte de Ciel. Um, it's an alternative program. It's more, you could say, in a sense, a little bit more advanced than Stellarium. Stellarium is sort of your basic um, program, but this is more professionally aligned. At least it looks more boring. So <laughs> that's the real difference. But Stellarium can, uh, sorry, Cardicel can do a lot of other things that Stellarium can't. So it's, but, but for the usage here, 
I would recommend um, Stellarium because we're not going to do anything advanced with controlling telescopes or something like that. Uh, on my personal own telescope, I usually sometimes use uh, Stellarium to control to, to maneuver the telescope around. You might have the need for um, what is called SAO image, uh, SAO image DS9. Please, if you search for this program, don't just search for DS9 because then you'll get Star Trek DS9 instead. Search for SAO image DS9. And finally, uh, for some of the things, I'm not sure I'm going to go into so much in depth with that, but if you want it, I will certainly give you more information about that. It's uh, Python 2.7, and you'll need uh, Matplotlib, uh, NumPy, and SkyP. I can give you a, a video, um, a computer video, the computer screen, what I see and, and what you see. I can give you that where I show you how to install um, Python 2.7. It has to be Python 2.7 because some of the keywords that I use in my scripts won't be available for you if you use uh, Python 3.1 or whatever it's called now, uh, the new version. So uh, that's very important that you go for that alone. In order to find Stellarium, you can go into this web page here. Please select 64-bit if you have a 64-bit computer because it will increase the utilization of your memory and it will generally make the program a little bit faster. So that's the, the main reason. And you can you can get in on this web page as you can see here. Uh, Sao Image DS9, you can get on this uh, web page here. Um, it should be available uh, still, but you might, if this web page here is, is outdated, you'll have to search for it yourself. And again, select 64-bit if you can. So what I recommend you do now is that you pause the video and then you try to find these programs and then you try to install them. At least try to find Stellarium and install that. And then I will come back to you. I hope that you have uh, paused the video and installed Stellarium. What you would like to do when you have installed Stellarium on your computer is to upgrade the database. Now, like I said, I'm going to make a separate video on how you can do that. It, of course, in, in the classroom, I was able to actually show you it on my computer. I'm not able to do that now, but I will make a video where I install Stellarium on my uh, desktop computer, upgrade, upgrade the database, and then show you all the li little things that you can change and the, the bells and whistles of Stellarium. But uh, let's continue to the night sky. So here you can see an image of how we look at the night sky. So usually we tend to um, explain sizes in astronomy using degrees. As you can see here, I'm afraid that I have forgotten to uh, remove something or change something. You can see up in the header up here, it says Winkler. That's in Danish. I will translate it for you. It is angles. So. When we measure something in astronomy, we usually use angles and, and we, we subdivide angles into something called um, arc minutes. And then we can subdivide arc minutes into arc seconds. Now, as the name hopefully suggests, one degree is 60 arc minutes and one arc minute is 60 arc seconds. So you can sort of imagine that we subdivide um, angles, uh, degrees into, well, arc minutes and arc seconds. Other than that, it's the same as you know it from school. A whole circle is 360 degrees and that's all we do. Now we can measure these things using our hands, as you will see here. So the tip of your uh, index finger, I think it's called, pie finger, <laughs> I'm not sure what's called. Um, the tip of your index finger hold out when you stretch your arm. I'm not sure you can see my hand, but if you you have to stretch out your arm, then the tip of your index finger will roughly be one degree. If you bend your finger like this, again, your index finger and hold it out as much stretch as you can, this part here of your finger will roughly be three degrees. This part here will be four degrees. And this part here, will be six degrees, as you can see on the slide. Across your, the palm of your hand, that like this, again, hold it out in stretch, that will be roughly 10 degrees. Now, arc seconds and arc minutes, well, then you have to divide your index finger into 60 little bits, and then you can get it into arc minutes. And obviously you can <laughs> figure out by now that you can't measure 
uh, arc seconds with your finger. Like I said, uh, angles, they are measured in degrees, arc minutes and arc seconds. As it, And as you can see here, how we index them. So the little circle is degrees. The I'm not sure we call it a uh, goose eyes in Denmark. I'm not sure one of these uh, little things is uh, an arc minutes and two of them like this is arc seconds. You, some, some call them quotation signs, but I'm not sure that is uh, the right word to use here. And again, one degree is 60 arc minutes and we can then um, subdivide that into 60 arc seconds. So as you can see here, this is how the sky is sort of subdivided into uh, different degrees and and where the how things are moving around on the sky. You can see that uh, the Earth is rotating and as the Earth is rotating, you will see different parts of the sky and you can measure uh, the position of the different elements, the different uh, things, the stars, the planets and so on. You can measure there. Um, sizes using using degrees and arc seconds and arc minutes, but we also have a coordinate system on the sky that we're going to talk a little bit about. So the way the sky night sky is changing for you when you go out and look, it's it seems to you obviously that it is the night sky that is changing, but in fact, as you hopefully know, it is not the sky that is changing, but it's your position that is changing. So as the Earth rotates you will see different parts of the sky. And obviously we will have different parts of Earth that is illuminated by the sun because the Earth is rotating. Now, one thing that you might, you have to consider, and that's, I, I guess that's a bit hard for some, some people to understand is that at any given point, one half of the Earth is illuminated all the time. That's a fact. So you may ask why then don't we have 12 hours of night and 12 hours of day? Well, that's because the Earth is slanted. It has an angle of 23.5 degrees. Now, in order to understand what these degrees mean, you have to understand that we tend to place a non-physical plane along the rotation of the planet. So if you sort of could look at the solar system um, face on, you would see all the planets aligned in their rotation like this. And that plane, as you can see, going through the sun and through the, the orbits of all the planets, we call that ecliptica. So we say that the Earth is, the, most of the planets are placed at a 90 degree angle compared to ecliptica. So that is our zero so so 90 degrees that is um perpendicular to ecliptica that is our zero that's our, our our main point so the earth is rotated or slanted 23.5 degrees compared to that now it's important for you to know notice that it is not 23.5 degrees compared to ecliptica that would be something else something like 78 70 70, 77, something like that. 77.3, I think it is. It is very important for you to know that this is, this is, the normal is perpendicular to ecliptica, and then the Earth is slanted compared to that normal. So as you can see here, the night sky changes not only because the Earth is rotating around its own axis, but also because the Earth is rotating around, uh, orbiting around the sun. So, that is why, because the Earth is slanted and is orbiting around the sun, then you will see different parts of the sky throughout the year. That is why, for example, in where I live, Orion is visible in the summer period, I think it is. I'm not sure about that. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to check ch check it for the next time. I think it's Orion that's visible in, in, visible in some period. And we have, and it is almost not visible um, in the winter period. And that's unfortunate because that is where I usually take my telescope out. But nevertheless, that's I digress. But but yeah, you can see here on this slide here how the Earth is rotating around the sun. But you can also see the Earth is rotating around itself. And that is why we have night and day. So night and day is solely a question about the Earth's own rotation about it, its own axis. 
Whereas the difference in, in, in seasons and the different um, constellations that you can see all year round, that is due to the fact that the, the Earth is orbiting around the Sun. Now, as you can see here on this on this slide here, because now it's it's, it's really exaggerated on this image here, but but as you can see, the Earth is uh, <laughs> the Earth is um, slanted a little bit. The darker the darker part down here, I would say, is supposed to be nighttime, and the lighter part of around here is supposed to be the daytime. Now. As you can see, they say there is an apparent rotation of the celestial sphere because when you go out and look at the skies, it seems that the stars is sort of moving across your field of view. And obviously they are, but well, in fact, that it is you that, like I said, it's you that is moving, it is not the stars. So that is why we have stars that rise and set. And that is also why there are some stars you can see at some times of year. And there's some stars that you can see uh, and another time of year. There are also stars that are solely for the northern hemisphere, and there are also stars that are from solely for the southern hemisphere. So, for example, um, the stars we can see here on the northern hemisphere, uh, the north at the north celestial pole, Polaris, they are not visible from the southern hemisphere, but both are somewhat visible around the equator of the Earth. So this is also why when you are at different places on the Earth, you can see that the stars have different rotational patterns. So for instance, if uh, where I live at the US, some, I'm, I don't live in the US, but this is at the U, in the US, roughly where I live somewhat. You can see that the stars are sort of moving in this direction here. Now I can't actually see the slide here, so I hope I'm pointing in the right direction. Maybe it's this way here, I'm not sure. But the important thing is that you can see if you're at the North Pole, the stars would be rotating like this, as you can see here. They're going sort of straight past the polar bear. And if you're at the equator, the stars will go straight up and down. And that is because the Earth is slanted, the Earth is a sphere, and the Earth is rotating around its own axis. So at the Northern Hemisphere, we have a relatively important star, especially if you are an amateur astronomer, because we usually, um, if you have an equatorial mount, you usually uh, lock your telescope towards the North Star, because that star is relatively close to the North Celestial Pole, roughly one degree um, beside it. So if you take a close look at a telescope that is pre precisely aligned at the North Pole, the North Celestial Pole, you will see Polaris moving around in a little circle. It is not perfectly aligned. Actually, it's not aligned. It's just not perfectly positioned over uh, the North Celestial Pole. But in order to find the North, Cel the, the North Star, you can use this. I usually use the tool that I look at uh, Ursa Mayer or the Big Dipper. I take the, if you sort of imagine that it is a wagon, it's not, it's a bear, but if you imagine it's a wagon and you take, I hope that I'm pointing in the right direction here. If you take the last parts of that, the, the rear part of the wagon, and then you just follow the stars up like this, then you should end up at the North, uh, the North Star. And if you have found the North Star before, you are definitely not in doubt whether you have found it because it resembles just a smaller version of the Big Dipper. So... That is probably also why it's called Ursa Mina or uh, the Little Dipper. And let's continue. We also have, uh, I think it's the Hunter Botus. And in that constellation, we have a very bright star called Arcturus. And later, uh, a little bit further down around here, I hope I'm pointing at the right place, you have the brightest star in the constellation vehicle, which is the Virgin. Makes perfect sense, right? Which is called Spica. Let's continue. So, in order to figure out where the, not only the North Celestial Pole, but also where the geographical North Pole is, you can roughly use uh, the North Star. 
So again, I have some slides here that are in uh, the, the pictures are in Danish. They are from uh, the book that I used at the, the high school. But as you can see here, the North Star, and it's, it's not really that precise here, but they're trying to show us that it is, you can see that the, the Little Dipper is sort of um, moving around. Uh, sorry, the, the Big Dipper is sort of moving around the North Star like this. And also we can find out what the height of the North Star uh, over the horizon is, because that would be the same as the latitude. So in this case, the height of Polaris, where I live, is roughly 50, 53 degrees, because I live at the, at the 50, 53rd uh, latitude, uh, latitude, latitudinal line, that is. So that's one way you can figure out the height where you would uh, expect the North Star to be, but it is also a very good way for you to figure out, at least when you're on the North Celestial Pole, that is, if you're on the South, not so much. But on the North Celestial Pole, you can use the height of the North Star over the horizon to figure out what your latitude is. So you can sort of give a get a rough idea of where you are latitudinal. Now we're going to take a look at something that is very important for astronomy. And that is the coordinate system that we use in astronomy. And that is, this is called rectascension and declination. We also symbolize rectascension with, a alpha, with an alpha. And we uh, um, symbolize the declination with a delta. As you can see here and here roughly. So uh, unfortunately, again, the, the figure that I have is in Danish, but the idea is that when you have a star at some point on the sky, then the uh, there is something called the, the spring area. It is a spring point. I'm sorry, I don't think I really got that explained very well here. So the thing is that what I call the spring point is actually comparable or is actually the exact same as what you would call the vernal equinox. So the vernal equinox has the rect ascension zero. So that is why it is our point of origin when we figure out these things. So that's the idea. It is the vernal equinox that is the point of origin for the rect ascension system. I'm not sure what it's called in uh, in, in English. I'm going to figure out that out for you uh, in the next uh, the next lecture, but. That is the point where the rect ascension is, I think it's it's 12 o'clock or zero, 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 zero. It's 24 hours if you want to use the, the 24 system. And from that on, you can then figure out, that is sort of the, the, the main point we use, that's our base point. And from that point, you can go out to a certain distance. That would be the rect ascension. And then from that point, and that will be, along your horizon line that is well in fact it will be along the, the the earth horizon line but you're going to see that our coordinate system on the sky is 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 in the same direction as the earth so it's not they're not crossing each other each other and that's the difference also between rect ascension and declination and uh, altitude and azimuth now altitude and azimuth would be sort of when you go out and look on, on the night sky uh, then you can also have a, a point of origin. But from that point of origin, you will then go a certain number of degrees along your horizon and then a certain number of degrees upwards. The rect ascension and declination system is aligned with the north celestial pole. So that would be, unless you're living uh, either at the north pole or at the equator, it will be slanted uh, compared to your horizon. Now you can, again, you can figure out what, what the, that angle would be because obviously if you're at the equator, the North Star would be at roughly zero degrees. And when you're at the North Pole, North Star will be roughly 90 degrees. So you can figure out how much that system, that, that uh, coordinate system is slang, slanted compared to your position. But nevertheless, that's the coordinate system that we, we use. So there's a little bit, some strange things about this coordinate system, because you can imagine that when we calculate things in degrees, 
then we would use the both degrees for the rect ascension and the declination. But that's not the case. The case is that the rect ascension or alpha, it is divided into hours, minutes, and seconds. So if you get a rect ascension coordinate, that would be something like uh, 12, 53, uh, 22. That would be the coordinate in the rect ascension. And that is obviously because the Earth is rotating roughly with a full rotation in 24 hours. So that is why we have that. Now, the rect ascension is different from the hours that you have uh, locally, but the rect ascension is defined according to what is called a sidereal, the sidereal time. Now you can look it up. I will show you a link to a calculator where you can figure out what the sidereal, sidereal hour is on, on your position. What you can use the sidereal hour is to figure out where a certain object that you want to observe will be at the highest point where you live. Now, please do remember that the, the altitude of that object is also dependent on the declination. And the declination is measured in degrees, and obviously also in arc seconds and arc minutes. And is well, you can say, let me just say for the rect ascension, as you can see here, down here somewhere, it is goes from zero, 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 zero hours, zero, 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 uh, zero hours, zero minutes, zero seconds, all the way up to 23, 59, 59, um, 23 hours, 59 minutes, 59 seconds. You could also say it's, uh, you could, you could replace the 12, the, the zero, zero, zero with a 24 hour. That, that's not really important. What is important, however, is that the declination, of course, is also divided in degrees. And obviously it goes from minus 90 to 90 degrees. Now, why does it do that? Well, that is because zero degree declination would be just right along the horizon of that coordinate system. So if you take the North Star up here, then you would have sort of a celestial equator like this in relation to this coordinate system here. That would be zero degrees. Now, if you go upwards, and unfortunately, you could say that uh, it is probably us here at the North Celestial Pole that has decided this system. So obviously we have the positive numbers. So if you go upwards towards the North, uh, the North Star, the North Celestial Pole, you would go from zero to 90 degrees. If you go the other way towards the South Celestial Pole, it will go down to minus 90 degrees. And obviously you can subdivide it into arc minutes and arc seconds. And yes, like I said, uh, one word that we use for objects that are at the highest point in the night sky it is their culmination. Now I say night sky with a little twist because many objects on the night sky here where I live, they have their full culmination during the daytime. And obviously I can't observe them then. So culmination doesn't necessarily mean that you can see the object when it's culminating it's only it only means that it is there and like i said you can use the sidereal hour where you live the sidereal time where you live in order to figure out when that object is at the highest as i remember it i will look it up to the next time when you have an object that is that has a certain let's say 12 hours, zero minutes, zero seconds, and has a declination of 55 degrees. When your sidereal hour is 12, zero, zero, I'm going to shorten that. I won't say 12 hours, 12 minutes, and so on. I'll just say 12, zero, zero. And that is respectively hours, minutes, seconds. When you have an object that is 12, zero, zero, and your sidereal hour is 12.00, then that object would be at, in this case, 55 degrees. So relatively a good, good way above the horizon. That's when you can observe it. All right, so that's uh, the, when, when objects are culminating and we have objects that are, well, all objects on the night sky will culminate if they're visible at some point. We also have some objects on the North Celestial Pole and also at the South Celestial Pole that is called circumpolar. And that means that they have an, both an upper and a lower culmination. Now, most objects on the night sky here where I live, 
only have an upper culmination because that is when they are at the highest point. Their lowest culmination would be below the horizon and that's why we don't use it. We don't count it in. But we also have these circumpolar objects that is essentially objects that never set and they have both and as you can see here, an upper culmination up here and a lower culmination down here. So there, those, those are circumpolar. So that is sort of the, ba the, the basic way that we can orient ourselves on the sky. Let me just quickly uh, sum it up. We have, we can use our hand when we stretch out our arm, we can use our fingers, one uh, index finger, the, the width of your index finger is roughly one degree. Then we have two, three, four degrees. And the, the width of our palm in stretch arm is roughly 10 degrees. So you can use that to figure out for example, how big is the moon? It should be roughly, I think it's five degrees, something like that. Then you can compare it to your finger like this and then take a look. Let's go into the constellations now. So in, in when we talk about constellations, we have three sort of different ways we can talk about constellations. So over here, we have the observed constellations. That is how you would look at it when you go out in the, in the night sky. The scientific constellations, as you can see roughly around here somewhere, they are a bit different because they don't represent any given shape, but they more sort of subdivide uh, the uh, night sky into different areas. So when we say an object, for example, like in this case here, belongs to Orion, it would simply mean that it is that that, that object is found within those yellow line yellow lines you can see that is encompassing the Orion uh, constellation. And then finally, you sort of have the classical or the historical um, constellations, as you can see over here. So at the northern hemisphere, we have something called the Summer Triangle. It is uh, comprised of three stars. We have uh, Deneb, let's see uh, Deneb, which is over here, Vega, which is um, somewhere here, and Altair, which is somewhere around behind me, somewhere around there. And uh, those are found in different constellations. So for example, Deneb is found in Cygnus. Someone called that the Northern Cross. In Denmark, we call it the Swan, because you can see we have the tail around. The tail is Deneb and then the head is uh, the, the long neck, as you can see. Well, you have to have some imagination in order to see that it is a, a well, it is a, a swan. Then we have uh, Vega in uh, the constellation uh, Lyra. I'm not sure what it's actually called in, uh, in, in English. In Denmark, we call it Lyon, but it's a musical instrument. And finally, we have Alta, which is found in the constellation Aquila, uh, close to uh, Sakita. So, uh, and we also have Delphinus. Those are names that I don't normally recognize because we call them something different in Denmark, but uh, you can find them on the night sky. We also have uh, the Winter Triangle. We, for example, have, and that is comprised of uh, Betelgeuse or Belgeuse. It is comprised of Procyon and it's comprised of Sirius. So Betelgeuse is the red giant star in the constellation Orion. That is the, the hunter, I think it's the, the, the fighter or something like that. Orion was a, a Greek mytho mythological person. He has his shield and his sword. And he's, uh, as I seem to recall the story, he's, called, he's hunting uh, Taurus, the bull. We have, um, Procyon, which is a star in uh, Canis Minor, it should be somewhere around here. Canis Minor is uh, <laughs> the little dog. So how someone can see that as a dog, I'm not sure about that. And finally, we have uh, Sirius, which is the the brightest star in the big dog, then Canis Major. And then we have some other constellations on this map. We have. Uh, uh, Gemini, the twins up here with Castor and Pollux. And then we have Auriga somewhere around here with the bright star called Capella. Let's compare in order to figure out sidereal coordinates of time versus ordinary time. So one sidereal day is actually 23 
hours, 56 minutes and 4.1 seconds. Whereas one ordinary day length is 24 hours. But they are both measured in 24 hour interval. Now you can see here I've, I've put in two um, web pages here. And here you can check out a conversion between ordinary and sidereal day. And I should also have put in, there's an uh, rectization declination converter, but there's also, I'm not sure whether it is real time that link I can make a video about it, but but uh, I'm not sure about that. But you can use that to sort of, well, convert your ordinary daytime, the, the, the hours that you have now, to sidereal hours. You can also do it the other way around. So like I said, a direct ascension gives us the best time to observe in the sidereal time. We have uh, the star speaker, which has the coordinates uh, alpha which is 13 hours, 25 minutes and 11.1, uh, sorry, 11.6 seconds. And uh, I have uh, the, the OG here is O in Danish, which is, uh, <laughs> sorry about this. It's, I, I, I guess I've, I have rushed it a little bit when I made this, uh, these slides here. It is and, it should say and. And the declination uh, minus 11 degrees, nine arc minutes and 41 arc seconds. That's all. That's all I had for you in this lecture here. If you have questions, then put them down in the comments below and then I will try to answer them. I guess there might be, I, I probably are some things that is relatively unclear to you right now. And then if you give me comments down below, I can sort of try to adjust the next lecture according to that. That is how I would do it in a in an ordinary high school. I would have sort of a dialogue with my students and then they, they could tell me, well, Michael, I think sort of so and so. What I suggest you do to the next time is that you try to figure out what is, when would you be able to observe uh, the star speaker where you live? So you have to use the, the, the converter that I showed you to go uh, to find the sidereal time at your place. And then you have to punch in the numbers here, 13 hours, 25 minutes and 11.6 seconds in order to, uh, to see how you can do these things. I hope that you have uh, enjoyed yourself and I certainly hope that you have learned something. Now, I'm sorry that uh, this uh, first episode, this first lecture was a little bit uh, abrupt and problematic. It's because my computer wanted to do a heck of a lot of things while I was recording. So, well, you know how it is. But uh, nevertheless, um, just like always, if you like my video here, then uh, give it a thumbs up. If you don't like it, well, you can give it a thumbs down. And of course, you know, if you want to follow this course here and you want to learn more about astronomy, it would be a really good idea for you to press that little one, one down here, somewhere around here, that little subscribe button and the bell next to it. And then you'll get a notification whenever I put out a new video. And then you can sort of just, if you don't want to watch the game videos, then you can just sort of go around them and just look at the, the astronomy videos here. Like I said, I will uh, try to uh, put out a new video every week. I can't promise it because, you know, I do other things than this. I have a newly found hobby with my son. We are collecting uh, Warhammer figures and playing with them. So it takes a bit of time for me to paint them because they are relatively small. And they are, well, you know, my old hands and I'm shaking and all that. It's pretty hard to paint those little figures, but I do my best, the little minis. Other than that, well, I guess I only have left to say thank you for watching and I will look forward to seeing you in the next episode. Bye-bye.